welcome. Returning to the tabernacle here this morning at Kilkeel. It's a joy. Always is a joy to be with you. I take the opportunity of thanking you for your interest, support, and prayers for the work of Acre Gospel Mission. Uh, during this year, the first half of this year, we've been quite very busy, as a matter of fact, in the work of the mission. Uh, during March, uh, we were in Brazil. Uh, I should say I was in Brazil. Audrey wasn't with me. I was there for the 60th anniversary of the church in Labria. Uh, during this very weekend, the 4th and 5th of June, they're having a special uh, memorial service. Uh, Ina Orr was 62 years dead yesterday by the date, and they're having a special uh, services or having special services outside the church in Labria because the church just would not accommodate them. And last year when they did it, they had 1,500 people who gathered in Labria, and that is just absolutely amazing. Uh, I was there for the 60th anniversary of the church. And when we look back to the beginning of that work away in 1956, why it was hard and difficult. When Fred Orr, uh, when his wife died, Ina died at 29 years of age in that town that was hostile to the gospel, where the bishop had written, thank God evangelicals have never come to Labria. Why? They arrived that day on the 4th of June, 1954, and one of them was already dead. She was buried in Labria. Uh, Fred went on up to Boca do Acre, but came back to Labria in August of that year. And an old Syrian gave him an acre of land. On that land, James Gunning built a house. That house was the beginning of the work. The veranda of the house is where we held the meetings. You may guess that when we arrived in 1965 in Labria, Audrey and I, there were about 30 to 40 people attending the work. And that was in 10 years, hard, difficult years of work. Oftentimes, when they went out to preach the gospel in the open air or distribute tracts, the priest would come after them. He used to take the tracts off the people. One day, he took all the tracts off the people and took them to the parochial house. And James Gunning, James, well, he stuck his neck out. He went to the priest's house, knocked the door, and when the priest came, he said, did, did you take those gospel tracts from the people? He said, I did. He says, those don't belong to you. Those are mine. You have no right to take them. So the priest gave them back to James. And James went back and gave them all out again and, uh, and sowed the good seed of the Word of God. Well, over the years, people have poured their lives into Labria. Fred or Alan Loney, Audrey and I were there for a while, Hazel Miskimmon, some eight years, Lucy Marr, seven years. Well, we were there for the 60th anniversary of the church, the Friday night, the Saturday night, and the Sunday night. Five to 600 people gathered there to worship the Lord. Precious souls were saved. Nineteen people were baptized. And that's what God is doing in Labria. And so one of the joys of old, old age is to be able to look back on 60 years and see the great things that God has done. And what God has done in the past encourages us for the future. We often say his love in times past forbids us to think. He leaves us at last in trouble to sink. Each sweet Ebenezer we have in review confirms the sweet promise, he'll help us quite through. And so the Lord has done great things for us, and thank God he will yet do those. Also, this is not a deputation meeting, but I should say that in uh, the month of May, we were in Portugal. A team was in Portugal for the dis distribution of the scriptures at the pilgrimage at Fatima, when 120,000 Gospels of Luke were distributed to the people. And we just don't know where those Gospels will go. Do pray for the sowing of the Word of God. But we were also there for a special weekend of meetings at a place called Santo Andre. Santo Andre is a difficult town. It was uh, created because of refugees who had come from Angola and Mozambique. And they settled in Portugal, so they created this town called Santo Andre, a town of immigrants. The work started in that town some 30 years ago with Stephen and Hetty Smith. It has been slow and difficult. The church there that had been gathering uh, was about 25 to 30 people. They were meeting in an apartment. Some of you have been there, I know, that it was uh, the bottom apartment of a, a, a sort of block of flats. It was uh, on the outskirts of town and very inconspicuous. About two years ago when I was there doing meetings, 
uh, Aroldo, the Brazilian missionary, he said to me, there's a building here in the center of town. He took me to see it. It looks like a, chill, it looks like a church, but it's, it was a furniture warehouse. And he said, don't you think that would make a great church? I said, it certainly looks like a church. He says, I'm trusting God's going to give it to us. He said, it costs 100,000 pounds. I thought to myself, well, in your dreams, God bless you, our old. Well, he took that stand of faith. God honored that stand of faith. And I was there in November when Aroldo signed the contract to, to purchase that building. Not only there in November, but we were there on the 7th of May to preach at the opening of the building. It was buckling rain on that day. But over 200 people gathered in for the opening of that new church in Santo Andre. And on the Sunday morning, 100 people were gathered there for the worship service in Santo Andre. So again, we thank God for what he's doing. And I mention all this to you for you who have interest in the work of Acre Gospel Mission. Thank you for your prayers, your encouragement and support. And next weekend over at Glenada is the Acre weekend. If you're free, come by on the, at least on the Saturday. Dr. Bill Woods will be there taking part. And I'll be giving a, a, a PowerPoint presentation of what I've been telling you about Labria. That will all be on Saturday evening. However, let's turn now to the Word of God as we find it in Exodus chapter 3, the book of Exodus and chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, and we're reading at verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of, his, of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the, loss, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, but put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their ta taskmasters, for I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up of, uh, out of that land onto a good land and a large into a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I, also, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest Bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go on to Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt I say unto the people of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Over there in Exodus chapter 33 and verse 18. 
It is Moses is on Mount Sinai. The mountain is on fire with the glory of God. God is near, and God promises to Moses not only his presence, but his grace. But just one verse, and he, that is Moses, said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. May God bless to us these readings from his sacred word. I don't know about you, but I'm encouraged that so much of the Bible is taken up with biography. The Bible is a theological book, but God does not give to us this theology in chunks like a, a textbook that would be difficult to read. But rather, he illustrates his truth. He uh, illustrates his truth through the lives of men and women of faith with all of their flaws. These people, sometimes we call them heroes of the faith. And yet, the Lord does not put them on pedestals made of marble to be polished. But rather, he shows us to them that they are men and women with like passions, like desires, like feelings that all of us have. They have their flaws. That is why when we come to look at these personages, such as Abraham and Isaac, Jacob, and this morning as we come to look at Moses, we're not looking at them in the distant past, over the ages, over the centuries, uh, with a sort of telescope looking back. But rather, we come to them with a stethoscope, listening to their heartbeat. What is it that motivated them to living? What is it that activated them in their lives? I don't know about you, but most certainly over my Christian life, I've been encouraged with the biographies of great people. I remember the book Gates of Splendor telling the story of Jim Elliot and the other missionaries who were martyred in Ecuador. The books of Isabel Kuhn, who was a missionary in China, and her wonderful books. The book of C.T. Studd. And so we go on with great biographies that have blessed and benefited our lives. And so it is when we come to the lives of these men. And especially when we come to the life of a man called Moses. Moses. Where do we start when we look at the life of a man called Moses? Remember, he was a baby in Egypt, hidden in a nark of bulrushes by his mother. He became a prince in Egypt, adopted by the daughter of Pharaoh, and educated in all the skills and sciences of that great land. That is, until he killed a man one day in the defense of an, Egypt, of an Israeli. And because of that, he became a, a wanted man, a baby, a prince, and and now a wanted man, he had to flee. He fled to Midian, and there he met his wife. And, and there he was, a shepherd for 40 years. During those 40 years, he never again heard of God. He never again heard God speak to him. They were 40 years of silence. Fled there because he felt he had failed. However, after those 40 years, as we've been reading this morning, God appeared to him in the burning bush and spoke to him and not only recommissioned him, but reactivated him, revived him, so that he became not only a leader, but a lawgiver, an intercessor, a captain, the man whom God buried on Mount Nebo. What an illustrious life. It was D.L. Moody who said of the life of, of uh, Moses, Moses lived 120 years. His life was divided into three parts. For the first 40 years, he was a prince in Egypt thinking that he was a somebody, educated, prestige, a prince, a somebody. For the next 40 years, he was hidden in the back end of the desert finding that he was a nobody. My friend, how, how quickly life can fall like that. Take us from a mountaintop down into the valley. Take us from the heights, perhaps, of a pedestal to, to, to be dashed in pieces in the back end of a nowhere. That was Moses, as somebody who became a nobody. But for the last 40 years of his life, he discovered what God can do with nobodies. And isn't that the truth? The Bible reminds us over there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where the Corinthians were priding themselves that some belong to Peter and others belong to Paul. And, and even others said, well, we're more exclusive. We belong to Christ. 
Paul said, look among yourselves. Look at your own calling. There are not many noble, not many rich, not many wise. But rather God has chosen the, the foolish things of the world, the weak things of the world, the despised things of the world, the nothings of this world. That no flesh should glory in his presence. And my friend, that's exactly what God did with this man, Moses. If we could interview Moses and ask him about his early life, he would tell us, that he had parents who had hid him in faith. His mother not only hid him in faith, but in an amazing way, the providence of God turned. She was actually commissioned and paid by the Pharaoh of Egypt to raise Moses, her own son. It was almost like family allowance. She was being paid by the government to raise her own son, and that was a, a mystery of God's providence. And we were to ask Moses, uh, how was his education in Egypt, he would say, well, he got a great education. As I've already said, he learned all the skills of the Egyptians, the sciences of the Egyptians. They, they taught him how to make papyrus. They taught him how to build pyramids. They told him how to embalm the dead. But they never really taught him the things that he would need to know in the greater part of his life. They never taught him how to open a Red Sea. They never told him how to bring water out of a rock. They never told him how to bring manna out of heaven. Those things, my friend, God had to teach him. He was a God-taught man. A leader, a lawgiver. Well, how did you get on with the children of Israel? They must have loved you. Well, as a matter of fact, they didn't love me. At times, they hated me. At times, the million people, many of them wanted to go back to Egypt. They wanted to go back to the garlic and the onions of Egypt. And I had a hard time with them, as a matter of fact. So hard was my time that oftentimes I, I wanted to quit. On one occasion, I even wanted to die. Moses, if that is the case, what is it that kept you going? Well, we had it in our text as we read it in Exodus 33 and verse 12. What kept him going was the glory of God. Show me thy glory. My friend, through all the ups and downs of Moses' experience, through those days of, of heavy hearts, it was the sense of the glory of God that kept him going. Seeing the glory of God in the burning of the bush, seeing the glory of God coming down on the tabernacle, seeing the glory of God as a, a fiery pillar by night over the tent of Israel, or a, fire, a, a cloudy pillar by day. It was the sight of the glory of God that, that kept Moses going. My friend, it reminds me of a verse over there in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. In that chapter, the apostle Paul is dealing with Christian liberty. He is telling that as believers, we should live to the good and benefit of others. If eating meat causes my brother to stumble, I will refrain from eating meat. Why? Because I will do it for the good of others. But he ends up the chapter by saying this word in verse 31 when he says, Wherefore, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Think of that this morning. Whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, do all to the glory of God. I dare say to you this morning that for me, the glory of God in that sense is the greatest motivator of our lives. At the same time, it is the greater regulator of our lives. It is something, my friend, that not only guides us, but it, it governs us. Therefore, I ask you this morning that what you do throughout the week from Monday to Sunday, do you do it to the glory of God? Do you live life out to the glory of God? Whatever you do, whatever you do, my friend, in your work, whatever you do in your walk, whatever we do in the sense of what, wherever we go, is it to the glory of God? It is said of even Denisux, one of the inmates with Solzhenitsyn, in Siberia, 
Because of his Christian views in the days of the Soviets, he was banished for 10 years to Siberia. He had little to eat and little to cover his body in the, in the severe winters of Siberia. The nights were chilly and cold and very little sleep. But every morning he rose and he said that what he had to do on that day, the building of a wall, he didn't do it for the Soviets. He was doing it for the glory of God. Doing it for the glory of God. Moses, what is it that kept you going? It was the glory of God. What, what is the glory of God, we might ask? We remember the words of the catechism. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. The glory of God, my friend, is the sum total of all that God is. The awesome Creator, the great I Am, the, the Almighty, all that God is. It represents, my friend, not only the awesome nature of who God is, but our sense to glorify Him is to magnify Him, to honor Him. Uh, if you use the word honor, that whatever we do, we do it to the honor of His name, to glorify Him. Psalm 34 reminds us that we are to magnify the Lord, to glorify Him. In magnifying a thing, we tend to use the vernacular and say that when we magnify a thing, we make that thing bigger. But my friend, we can never make God bigger than what He is. He is the Almighty. We can never enlarge on the Almighty God, the Omnipotent One. But in effect, when you magnify a thing, you don't make the object bigger. What you do is you make your vision bigger. It is your vision that is enlarged, not the object that is enlarged, but your vision. And my friend, is it not true when we come to our God as we see Him in the life of Moses? It is to magnify Him, to see Him clearer, to see Him in a, in a greater way. How great is our God? The glory of God is something that appeared to Moses in the bush when the angel of the Lord appeared to him. It is in the book of Hebrews that we read that our God is a consuming fire. And if you read throughout the book of Exodus, you will find that when God came down upon the bush, the bush burned with fire. When God came down upon the mountain, the mountain burned with fire. It was the awesome presence and the glory of God. The glory of God was on the tabernacle. It filled the tabernacle with the cloud. It was over the tabernacle as a fiery pillar. It was the glory of God. And why was it important to Moses? Why is it the glory that kept him going? Well, let me just hang these thoughts with you this morning and try to relate them to your life as I try to relate them to my life. First of all, for Moses, when the task seemed too great for him, he needed to see the glory. We need to see the glory when the task seems too great for us. My friend, in our Christian pathway, God often throws up challenges for us, what really are opportunities for us, but for us they seem quite impossible. That is, tasks for us to do, work to which He calls us. And perhaps that is where you are this morning. God is challenging you about a particular avenue of service, and you feel it in yourself. You, you could never do it. You could never face up to it. Well, I say that to you this morning because think of Moses. Moses, the shepherd in the back end of the desert, feeling that life was all washed up, learning now for 40 years that he was a nobody where once he thought he was a somebody. When God suddenly appeared to him, we, we've been reading that in Exodus chapter 3, the, God appeared to him in the bush, and the bush was not consumed. It wasn't the bush that was important. My friend, it was the presence of God, the voice of God. It's not only what Moses saw and he saw the bush burn, but it's what Moses heard, Moses, Moses. And Moses answered and said, here am I. 
When God spoke out of the bush and said, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, the Bible tells us that Moses was afraid. Afraid? Afraid perhaps because he'd run away from God. He'd run away from Egypt. He'd run away from everything that he felt was important. And for 40 years, God hadn't, hadn't spoken with him. Maybe he felt, God's caught up with me now. God, God is going to chastise me now. But it wasn't to chastise. Rather, it was co to commission. Said God to Moses, I have heard the cry of the people of Israel. I have come down and I have seen their oppression. I have seen the Pharaoh and what the, the Egyptians are doing to them. And I will deliver them. Behold, therefore, now, he said, I, I will send you unto Pharaoh. Listen, when Moses heard that it was the voice of God, first of all, he was afraid to hear God speak. When he heard what God was going to do, that is to liberate the people of Israel, why, why this was wonderful, it is, it is fantastic. This is what he'd been longing for. This is what he tried to do when he killed an Egyptian. But it all fell around him. I will set my people free. But then he said to Moses, and I will send you unto them. If you go back to that portion of Scripture, you will find that in Revelation, or rather Exodus chapter 3 and verse 3, verse 4, Moses said to God, when God spoke out of the bush, he said, here am I. But if you look at verse 11, after that Moses heard the God speak and said, I will send you on to Egypt. The Moses who said, here am I, now says, who am I? Who am I? My friend, can I say that is the place all of us need to get to. Oftentimes to new missionaries, I tell them that when they volunteer to serve God on the mission field, they are saying, here am I, the words of Isaiah, here am I, sent me. But when you face the task and you're up against it and you see how, how great, how mammoth the task is, where once you said, here am I, you now say, who am I? It is the word of the Apostle Paul when he viewed his ministry and he said these words, who is sufficient for these things? Who am I that I should do it? My friend, it was important that Moses see his own emptiness. Remember what we said, once he thought he was a somebody, he would never have said, who am I? He might have said, I am a prince. But now here he is, empty, nothing. Who am I that I should? And the Lord said to him, Moses, it's not who you are that is important. It is who I am that is important. Therefore, when you go unto them, you shall say unto them, The I am hath sent thee. The I am. The I am simply means, my friend, the all-sufficient God. That's it. The deliverance of Israel would not come from who Moses was, but would come from who God is. And I say that to you this morning because... When that task seems too great for us, my God, friend, we need to see the glory, the sufficiency of the great I am. He is not the I was of Abraham. He is not the I was of Moses. He is still the I am today, absolutely sufficient when the task seems too great for us. He is not the I will be. But my friend, in the challenge and opportunity that God has put upon us just now, he is absolutely sufficient. I say that, and I think in the back of my mind of Bill Woods. When Bill Woods, he tells the story that when he left the Belfast High School, he had to leave because when it came to the important exams, he, he got worse than a D. He was down to zero and single digits in his results. When he went home and told his father that God was calling him to be a missionary on the mission field, his father said to him, the mission field, Billy says, with your qualifications, you'll not get to the potato fields. Well, the story of what God has done through Bill Woods, 
after 60 years almost in Brazil, is just an amazing testimony of what God can do with a nobody, a nobody. If you were to open your Bible over there in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul, who in chapter 2 had asked the question, 2 and 16, he asked, who is sufficient for these things? The Apostle Paul answered and said in verse 5, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but listen to these words, but our sufficiency is of God. Our sufficiency is of God, who has also made us able ministers of the New Testament. He's speaking of the ministry that God has given to him, the ministry to the Gentiles, ministry for which he would be beaten and left for dead. But who will give us strength and grace and ability? God is sufficient. God is sufficient. When the task seems too great for you, God is sufficient. He was sufficient for the needs of his ministry. He was sufficient, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8. He is speaking of the material needs that he would have. And he says to those Corinthians, he is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things you have all sufficiency unto every good work. The I am is abounding to us in his sufficiency in our ministry needs, in our material needs, and even in our physical needs. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the apostle Paul, having been caught up to heaven, is brought down to earth when he realized a messenger of the devil has been given to him, a thorn in the flesh, to buffet him. That, my friend, means to, to suck him and to beat him and to put him down. He said, this thorn in the flesh, be it what it may, he said, three times I prayed to God that he might remove it. Take it away, God. God did not say yes. God did not even say no. Do you know what God answered? My grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. My friend, can I say this morning that when the task seems too great for us, we need to see the glory. Our time is almost gone, and we've just got to this first point. Let me just underline the others. Not only when the task is too great for us, but when, when the enemy seems too much for us, we need to see the glory. Moses was to lead the people of Israel through the desert for all of those years. The Bible tells us he would come up against the Canaanites, the Amalekites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and all of these enemies that were around him. Moses was leading two million people, and in the midst of the people, he had a, a tent that was made of linen and made of badger skins. But, but these nations, my friend, they were mighty. They had chariots of iron. And above all else, they had temples that were beautiful. As Moses looked round and surveyed these enemies with all of their luxury and their numerous uh, armies, who will overcome them? They had temples, my friend, but they didn't have God. They had their armies, but they didn't have the Lord. In those temples, my friend, they... They sacrificed children. They practiced prostitution as a, as, as a ritual. It, it was a cesspool of iniquity given over to pornography. That's what was in paganism. When Moses would look round at all of those nations and then look at the humble tabernacle in the midst of Israel, what is it that made the difference? He could see the glory of God. He could see the pillar of cloud. At nighttime in the darkness, he could see the fiery pillar. He knew that God was in the midst of him. Don't we need that? Don't we live in a cesspool of iniquity today? We're surrounded and being bombarded with it, my friend, on television, through newspapers. And today, laws are being passed that reminds us, and with such rapidity, my friend, that it reminds us our blessed Lord must be coming soon. Do you know what we've got to do? We've got to keep our eyes on the glory. Keep our eyes on the glory. We're coming up to the 1st of July, and a lot of people are looking to 1916. 
celebrating 100 years. I just ask you to keep in mind Revelation 19.16. This is a good verse for this year and for this month. Revelation 6. Uh, uh, this year they've been looking at 1916 and the Easter uprising. Uh, uh, Revelation, uh, Easter was the 100th anniversary of the Faith Mission Convention in Bangor. But, but here's a great verse for the anniversaries of this year. Revelation 1916, it is our blessed Lord, and it says this word, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. My friend, we're in 2016, but that verse is still true. Keep your eyes on the glory. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He's coming soon. When the task is too great for us, when the enemy is too strong for us, listen, when discouragement is too much for us, when Moses came down from the mountain, my friend, the people had forsaken God. His own brother had built a, a calf of gold, a golden calf, and put it up. And they'd gone back to the worship of Egypt, and they'd broken the heart of God, and they'd broken the tablets of the law. And Moses could have turned away from them, and God said to Moses, I will make of you a new nation. I, I, will, I will build it. Moses interceded for Israel with an open heart and said, God, do not forsake your people. My friend, can I say discouragement is a tool the devil will use. And the amazing thing is that it doesn't come from out there in the world. Oftentimes it comes within the church. I still remember our brother Billy Kennedy, now with the Lord. When I was in Banbridge, Billy came and spoke one, one night, and he said, you know, as an evangelist, he says, as an evangelist, I've never had any trouble with unconverted people. They never give me a headache. But he says, I was a pastor for years, and Christian people broke my heart and gave me many headaches. He says, in, 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 in Iraq, the war was on in Iraq, he says they talk about friendly fire, Americans killing Americans, British killing British, and they call it friendly fire. He says they speak of it as if it was something new. It's been happening in the church for years. Christians discouraging Christians. Christians shooting Christians. Billy says I was at a church the other night, and I shook hands with this lady, and I held her hand. She talked, and she talked, and I kept shaking her hand. And then after about two minutes, I let go her hand. And the next lady came and just shook her hand and said, good night, let it go. And the lady said, you didn't hold my hand as long as you held her hand. Billy said, I just looked at her and I said, if you'd have slipped into my hand, but she slipped into my hand, I'd have held your hand longer too. Eh? <laughs> when discouragement seems too much for us, keep your eyes on the glory. Let me finish by saying this. When the task is too great for us, when the enemy is too strong for us, when discouragement is too much for us, when reward is too little for us. I say that this morning because Moses for 40 years led the people of Israel. Think of the Red Sea. Think of the deliverance out of Egypt. Think of the striking of the rock. Think of the manna that was given from heaven. Think of the clothes for 40 years. They never changed their shoes in 40 years. Isn't that amazing? God gave the law. This man was the leader of Israel like no other. You would think that at the end of his day, they would have a great celebration. Why? Uh, with Muhammad Ali dying, it's been wall to wall in every news thing all around our world, the greatest they've called him. But when Moses died, my friend, there were no fanfares, no parades, no celebration. As a matter of fact, after 40 years, he didn't even get to the promised land. God took him up to the mountain, Mount Nebo. And there away from human view, he gave to Moses a view of the promised land from Pisgah. He could see all of Canaan right up to Galilee. He could see it all. But he never got there. God buried him. No man knew where he was buried. They never put any stones up as the Jews would put stones. Do you think that was fair? I remember the day we were married. Winston Churchill was buried that day. What fanfare there was all across our country because of the great Winston Churchill. 
But for the great Moses, my friend, it all ended in silence. But that was not the end. When you go to Re Matthew chapter 17, the Lord Jesus is taken up to a high mountain, and he takes with him Peter, James, and John, and there he has transfigured before them. His countenance with the glory shines like the sun. His very clothing radiates the glory. And there his company, Moses and the light. The Moses who was buried in silence on the mountain is now sharing in the glory of the mountain with Jesus. They're speaking of his decease. They're speaking of the glory that is to come. You see, when we think of him in the mountain and say he ended in silence, but my friend, that was not the end. He shared the glory of the Savior. They tell the story of a missionary couple returning from Africa after 35 years of, of serving God in the heart of Africa. At the end of the 1930s, life was difficult then. President Roosevelt was also on the same, same boat. He had been to Africa for six weeks on a safari shoot. As the boat was arriving in New York Harbor because the president was coming home, why the bands were there and all the hullabaloo of American festivity, they were there with their trumpets and balloons and their banners to welcome home the president. But there was no one there to meet the missionaries after 35 years. The missionary husband turned to his wife and said, the president was in Africa for six weeks. And look at the welcome he's getting. <laughs> We've been there for 35 years. And there's no one here to meet us. The husband was a bit discouraged, but the wife turned to him and said, Honey, we're not home yet. We're not home yet. The Apostle Paul said that the light affliction of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the eternal weight of glory that is reserved for us. Keep your eyes on the glory. When the task is too great, when the enemy is too strong, when discouragement is too much, when the reward seems too little, show us the glory. Heavenly Father, bless this your word to all of our hearts and be glorified in each of our lives, we pray. Help us to run this race, looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. In his name we pray, amen.